Growing up in South Louisiana in the early years of the 20th century was as unique an experience as it was challenging. Hidden swamps and wooded bayous afforded young men the experience of fishing, hunting, and trapping, developing their talents with a gun and a knife while learning to survive on a keen mind and a strong back. Free time consisted of as many hours in the woods as possible, learning the skills they would eventually need to survive. It was a childhood in training for a war no one knew how to prepare for. I started trapping when, uh, before I uh, even started school. I was uh, probably about four, four and a half years old. Growing up uh, in the bayou, it was a perfect place for swimming. It was a perfect place for hunting, also for trapping, and, uh, and, and a wonderful place to, uh, to grow up. James Bullock was born and raised in Eunice, Louisiana, where he spent the days of his youth working on the family rice farm and playing along the secluded swamps and bayous hidden in the woods. Give me a fish hook and, and, and a line and a, and a rifle and a few bullets. And without a doubt, my early upbringing uh, is one reason why I'm, I'm still here today. It was his experience as a child that taught him the meaning of survival, a lesson he would be reminded of years later when his service would lead him to a surrender and over three years in a Japanese prison camp in the Philippines. A long and tortured experience that began with the infamous passage later called the Bataan Death March. The war itself, looking back, was, was nothing compared to what came later. Uh, when the, the Japanese first uh, arrived, they uh, lined us up in columns of war and counted us, and then started us out on the, uh, the only road out of the uh, peninsula, which was on the uh, east side of the peninsula or on the west side of uh, Manila Bay. Of course, the first people that we ran into as we started marching were the Japanese that uh, we'd been fighting for four months. And when we had nothing left to, uh, to steal, that's when they began to knock us around, to beat us. Anybody that had a steel helmet got it knocked off because I, I think the Japanese assumed that uh, that was a frontline soldier and uh, unfortunately I was the one that had a, uh, a steel helmet so uh, it, it went long when, um, before that was gone. We walked all day long, of course, without food, without rest, without water. The minute we got back on the road, the, uh, the Japanese uh, started uh, beating us. Trucks would go by and, uh, and they'd slam us with their, with their rifle butts. And uh, we began to, uh, people began to collapse. Uh, the POWs began to collapse, it, uh, from, either from fatigue or sunstroke or the lack of water. And uh, we soon found out that uh, that wasn't a thing to do because the minute uh, anyone collapsed, the Japanese would either shoot them or bayonet them. And uh, they, they weren't about to let anybody, uh, you know, for, stop for, for any reason at all. So it looked like, uh, without a doubt, uh, they were trying to kill us all. My, my time in the woods uh, as a youngster helped me out in training with the Army. We played cowboys and Indians in the woods and you had to sneak up on each other so you had to watch that you didn't crack a, a limb or something in front of you. On our, on our patrols, you had to be very careful that you didn't make any kind of noise or any kind of movement that would let them know you were there. Warren Burmaster spent his early days in Belchase, Louisiana, where his family owned and operated a successful service station. When the Depression hit and times became difficult, Warren was left to be cared for by his grandmother while his mother and father struggled to find work. In such difficult times, the family allowed him as much playtime in the woods and fields as possible. In the, in the woods, I was in the woods uh, quite a bit. We also did some still hunting where you go and look under the fry bushes. And if a rabbit's sitting underneath there, you can hardly see him. But if you look good enough, you'll see him sitting in the, in the end and you can shoot him and get him out. Hunting was a favorite pastime, in particular, hunting at night. For the young Cajun, 
The skills of stealth that would someday be needed in battle were first developed in pursuit of rabbits. My uncle loved to do night hunting. And the reason for our hunting was that we could kill quite a bit of rabbits at night with a light. And all you had to do was be good enough to see the red eye. And some nights we'd get 25, 30 rabbits. And, and we'd sell them the next day in Gretna for 50 cents a pair. Snow and ice blanketing the landscape in Europe added conditional challenges that Louisiana boys weren't accustomed to. Constantly under fire from a nearby German pillbox, the mission was ordered to approach the hidden trench bunker and determine the material it was made of. In the snowy darkness of a grim winter, Warren Burmaster came face to face with an enemy he never wanted to meet. It didn't get dark till 12 o'clock midnight, maybe one o'clock in the morning. They come and ask for volunteers for patrol. We're gonna have to make a a patrol the next morning. Burmaster, get me some men and get them ready to go first thing in the morning. I got them all set up. We put white sheets. We had snow on the ground. I got them to put the sheets on them, on the helmets, on their clothes, on their weapons, take out anything that would make noise. We started out, and when I got in no man's land, that's the distance between the Germans on one side and Americans on the other side, and you're looking at each other. No man's land is the middle part that nobody travels with or shouldn't. So when I got about middle ways in the no man's land, I turned a hard right and I made a left turn, which would put me through their line. And I got to a blacktop road. When I stopped at the blacktop road, my idea was to leave my men on this side and one man go across and see if he could find this building or whatever it was and then come back and let them know. And just about that time, I heard a clomp, 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 clomp. German soldiers marching. They all had iron uh, tacks on their boots. And 40 or more Germans came walking down the road and they came out and they stopped directly in front of me. And of course I was all white. I was on the side of the road unless they saw my cold air coming up. I was laying there and either this lead man or one of the men decided to come to the side of the road and take a leap. And when he did, it didn't hit the road and I hit the ground and it splattered on me. I'm, I'm sitting there and I could shine, if he, before he said the order, I could shine 40 pair of boots by just walking on the cross and coming back and going back and coming back. I crawled back to the lieutenant and said, what you want to do? He said, let's get out of here. My name is Isaac David Breedlove. I live in Lake Arthur, Louisiana. My parents and I were not very close. We was put in an orphan's home, abandoned by our mother at a young age. I grew up during the Great Depression, I enlisted in the Army April the 9th, 1937, and that was to go to Panama. Isaac David Breedlove was never given the opportunity to know his mother and father, and as a young man with few options, the military became a clear choice for building the future the only way he knew how. For most, the life of a boy at war was a daily education, and for some, an unforgiving reminder that without it, they had nowhere else to go. December the 7th, 1941, I was stationed on an, on an army base near Pearl Harbor. The men and I were waiting in the uh, jaw line when the first bombs fell. I got my baptism fire from the muzzle of a Japanese machine gun. I was on the island of Luzon, and we had uh, two tanks on a line firing. They told me to get the tank out of there. I crawled up on it, and the, uh, the Japanese tank fired and hit just below the driver's hatch. Uh, 
cutting the driver in two. One man sat in the driver's lap with the body just waist down and drove it out. I looked in the tank and all I saw was Every single day, Louisiana loses more veterans of the Second World War than ever before. Men and women, born and raised here in our hometowns, who built the very communities we live in today. These are their incredible stories that even after so many years have never been told. The lives of Louisiana's children who played each their own part in a war that changed the entire world. These are the stories of Louisiana's greatest generation. In combat, you're not allowed one mistake. If you do, you're in a body bag. 